Hello, everyone. Good evening Hello. and good afternoon. My name is Ronnie Rest, and I teach art history at Bakersfield College and also co-direct the Wiley and May Louise Jones Gallery, which is proudly hosting the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition, Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Fields, Revolución en los Campos. It is a great honor to introduce our guest this evening, an amazing woman whose life's work and activism this exhibition is based on, Ms. Dolores Huerta. And she will be in conversation with the Smithsonian Institution's Curator of Latino Art and History for the National Portrait Gallery, Dr. Taina Caragol. I need to take one moment to recognize the outstanding group of people that have made all of this possible. This has been an amazing community effort. Jeff Houston, the, the Jones Gallery's co-director and everyone in the art department. Oliver, Oliver Rosales deserves the credit for spearheading the exhibition coming to Bakersfield. Andrew Bond, who is behind the scenes here and has been instrumental in this week's Jess Nieto Memorial Conference. Bakersfield College's president, Sonia Christian, the Bakersfield College Office of Student Success and Equity, BC Student Government Association, Jack Hernandez, Reggie Williams of the Levin Center for the Humanities, the Arts Council of Kern County and the BC Foundation, specifically the Finlandson Endowment whose contributions helped fund what became a virtual gallery tour, which is now live and we'll share the link to shortly. I also must thank Maria Del Carmen Kosu, the project director for Latino initiatives at the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service and the entire sites team at the Smithsonian have been a dream to work with over this past year. Also, Lori De Leon and everyone at the Dolores Huerta Foundation who have dedicated their time and energy to be sure this exhibit is as impactful as possible in Dolores' hometown. And can we recognize that this is Women's History Month as well as National Farm Worker Awareness Week? Si se puede. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and time allowing, we will get to as many questions as possible. Thank you again. And I now hand off the mic to Ms. Maria Del Carmen Cosu from the Smithsonian. Buenas tardes, good afternoon to all. This is a very special moment because we're here with Dolores Huerta to be able to tell the story of her commitment to farm workers and to many, many causes and Taina and Ronnie, many thanks for allowing me to acknowledge some of our partners in this important project today. I would like to acknowledge first that this afternoon I'm speaking to you from the Washington DC area where the Smithsonian Institution is located on the native lands of the Piscataway, the Pamke, the Nankochatank and their descendants. Our respect and gratitude to them for the opportunity to work in this land. Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Fields, Revolución en los Campos is organized by the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service in collaboration with the National Portrait Gallery. This exhibition received federal funding and support from the Latino Initiatives Pool administ administered by the Latino Center, the Smithsonian Latino Center. A special thanks to our host, the wonderful team at Bakersfield College in Jones Art Gallery that made this exhibition and the virtual tour possible. I'm grateful to my partners at Bakersfield College, Oliver Rosales, Ronnie Rest, Jeffrey Houston, Andrew Bond, Monica Smith, and Leah Pendres, and all the staff, faculty, and students who made this public program possible today. Special supporters are the Bakersfield College Office of Student Success and Equity and the Art Council of Kern, Bakersfield College Student Government Office, of Office Association and Bakersfield College Finlinson Endowment. The exhibition has been made possible thanks to these contributions and support. And most important, I am thankful to Dolores Huerta herself for her trust in having us be able to tell her story, to her daughters who shared their stories, their personal photographs with us. Special thanks to my friend, Hermana Lori de Leon, to Juanita Chavez, Camila Chavez, and Alicia Huerta. Thank you, Dolores, muchas gracias. At the Smithsonian, we thank our leadership. Kim Sajet, Director, National Portrait Gallery. Eduardo Diaz, Director of the Smithsonian Latino Center. Diana Bosa Bastidas, Manager of the Latino Initiatives Pool Grant. And also 
at the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service, our director, Miriam Springle, and all the exhibition teams that made it possible. We are humbled and honored to be able to tell Dolores' critical American story. And we are very, very grateful to Bakersfield College for supporting us in developing these amazing virtual tour and programs to overcome the challenges of this pandemic. So thank you, Bakersfield College and the team. And now I would like to introduce my friend, Daina Caragol, Curator of Latino Art and History at the National Portrait Gallery, and Dolores Huerta. Thank you so much for your passion and contribution. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you, Daina. I want to thank you, Maria, for all of the hard work that you have done in this traveling exhibition. As we know, it's been in several states uh, now, and now it is uh, kind of close to home here in Bakersfield, where all of this history was made. And uh, you and Taina have just been incredible in, in doing all of this work. And, and I know that you were here in, in Bakersfield in person, and it's just sad that, you know, we have to, the pandemic is keeping us all separated right now, and we just can't all be together. But again, uh, I, I cannot thank you enough for all the work that you've done to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, my start. dear. It's really uh, an absolute pleasure to be here to, this afternoon with you. Thank you to all of those who have, who are joining uh, this program. Um, also, my thanks to Bakersfield College, to the Huerta family. Um, very, very special thanks to Dolores, uh, to Barbara Carrasco, who was uh, a very important connector at the beginning of this project, and also to Nora Dominguez. Uh, who's also a great friend of the project. Um, this program is really special because of a number of reasons. Uh, for one, it's in Bakersfield College. It's in your hometown, Dolores, and, and that already makes it hugely special. Uh, each venue that has received this, tool, this traveling exhibition has been very welcoming, very warm. Um, but I have to say there, there have been some that have been um, especially dear because of the, of the important part they have played in the story, as you just said. It's also a special program because it's at Bakersfield College and you have a very special connection to youth mm -hmm. as someone who, had, who has advocated for youth, who started her, um, her life path as an organizer young in life and who also trains youth to become engaged in our civic society. And finally, it's also special because it's National Farm Worker Awareness Week and you have dedicated your life to that cause. So it, it's incredibly meaningful to be here today with you. And I would love to, uh, with your help, share a little bit about the exhibition, how it started, and do one of our favorite things, one of my favorite things every time we open one of these traveling shows, which is seeing Dolores give the tour herself, you know, showing some of the images that are in the show and seeing and, and listening to her sharing anecdotes and bringing all the stories uh, to life. So that's what we're gonna do today. But before, before all of that, I want to ask you Dolores, how, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, like everybody else uh, with this pandemic, uh, just uh, waiting to bust out and get out there. <laughs> and again, I'm, it's a, it's a, so sad that, you know, uh, we have to be uh, locked down. Uh, all in, uh, Kern County is going to be opening up this week somewhat because uh, it's been one of the places where we've had uh, the most uh, deaths and the most illnesses uh, from COVID-19. So. And uh, I, I, I don't know how long the exhibit is going to be at Bakersfield College because so many of the folks that are going to be t with us today, uh, their parents or the grandparents were involved in the farm worker movement. I'm sure many of them uh, were on marches and strikes and uh, boycotts and many of the things that, that the farm workers movement was about. So uh, and in many ways, a lot of this will be very personal to them. And maybe they will uh, see things that they really didn't know, but maybe they just heard somebody talk about them but didn't actually get to see them themselves. <laughs> right, this will be a very relevant story. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I saw some photographs of you getting your vaccine. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're vaccinated, how, 
uh, how did that feel? Why did you make it a public, you know, uh, a public statement? Well, I wanted to make it a public statement uh, because uh, there are some people that might be wary about getting their vaccine. And, and since uh, I'm going to be 91 years old uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I thought it would kind of be an inspiration to people so they won't be hesitant about getting uh, their vaccine. So, and by the way, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, we have been doing uh, vaccine clinics ourselves in a couple of different areas. So, uh, you know, we just want to let people know that it, it, now is the time that you have to get your vaccine, not, not only for yourself, but for your family and for the community and for our whole country. Basically, we can say that because we want to get that herd immunity, but we can't get it unless everybody gets a vaccine. Absolutely, that's amazing to hear that the, the foundation itself has been doing vaccine clinics. How amazing, you are always doing amazing work. And um, I have a PowerPoint to share, so I'm going to um, share that screen right now so that we can um, start talking about the exhibition. Dolores Huerta, Revolu Revolution in the Fields, Revolución en los Campos is uh, an exhibition that really uh, came out of an original show um, organized at the National Portrait Gallery in 2015. Um, this was an exhibition in uh, conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the Delano Grape Strike that uh, launched the farm workers movement. And so um, the National Portrait Gallery is a museum in Washington DC. It's one of the 19 museums of the Smithsonian and it's where I work where I am curator of painting and sculpture and of Latino or Latinx art and history. And it's a museum of biography and portraiture. It's a museum that tells the story of the United States through portraits of people who have made contributions of national impact. And very often we think about historical anniversaries as occasions to mark and to revisit um, through exhibitions. And so we knew in 2013, when I started my job, that the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the farm workers movement was coming up. And um, I remember uh, our director, Kim Sayed, asking me, well, what kind of exhibition would you do? And so I had, uh, I had heard uh, the name Dolores Huerta in conjunction to Cesar Chavez. And I thought to myself, you know what? Uh, before answering that question, I, let, me, let me do some research because there's this name I've heard a lot, but I don't know enough. However, I have um, a hunch that she, that this woman uh, who is an important public figure now was also very significant in the farm workers movement. And I want to learn more about her to see if we can do a show about her. And so I went to, um, to, Wayne State University in Detroit, where the Walter P. Ruther Library of Labor uh, Archives is located. They have an imp impressive amount of materials um, and archival, archival materials on labor unions. And one of those collections is the UFW collection, the collection of the United Farm Workers papers. And so I started doing my research there and I came upon an abundance of documents, photographs, um, letters that signaled that Dolores Huerta had been a crucial figure in the farm workers movement and that an exhibition on her was really overdue. That this was a woman that needed to be known by everyone in the country that her contribution had to be registered by everyone. And that in the words of Cesar Chavez himself, she was co-architect of the farm workers movement. And so she deserved the credit and her story deserved to be explored. Dolores was, um, well, founded the National Farm Workers Association, which was the union that together with the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee which was a Filipino union, merged and formed the United Farm Workers. And in, uh, when the United Farm Workers was founded, she had uh, very important roles in its leadership. She was its vice president and also had a very multifaceted role as a picket captain, 
as contract negotiator, as a lobbyist, um, as a main communicator. She basically did it all. And, um, and she also did that while having her own family. And, um, and so this was a story that we decided to explore and that took the shape of this exhibition, One Life, Dolores Huerta, um, which was on view for almost a year. It was the first exhibition of the series that we do titled One Life that we dedicate to one historical figure and where we delve into their life history and their contribution to the country. And this was the first of those shows that we dedicated to a Latina, to, to any Latino historical figure uh, by that matter. And um, the first one also to be dedicated to a living figure. All of, all of the previous ones had been of people who had been deceased already. And so it was incredibly uh, powerful to have Dolores uh, be at the opening, participate in the, in, um, in, the, in the press conference where she spoke to, <laughs> that was the first time I was blown away because she spoke for like four hours straight to journalists and she was still very sharp, you know? <laughs> by the end of the third, fourth hour. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. Um, and, um, and then that exhibition was transformed very much through the efforts of Maria del Carmen Cosu into a traveling exhibition that has uh, toured the country. Um, and, and, and that process of transformation, I, I should say, required research, required us visiting Bakersfield uh, a few more times, visiting the foundation, seeing firsthand the work that Dolores does and also the foundation, uh, something that's very, that was very special about this project is that, um, and th this was very important to Dolores from the beginning, that this history not be seen as something from the past, but as a current, phenomenon as a as the seed of a continuum of social struggle and so um, she took us to the fields in Lamont um, we're very close to where you all are right now right in uh, all of those who are joining us from Bakersfield she um, she took us to her foundation to see how she engaged with youth who were uh, learning how to register voters. And um, we saw the very, um, the very practical dimension of her, of her organizing work, of her legacy, basically how it's done and, and what, why it matters and who it affects, who it impacts. And so this was the, the, the exhibition that we did at the Portrait Gallery was transformed into these graphic panels um, that allow us to share it with many more audiences across the country, um, sometimes in uh, some, so very often solving the problem of documents or artworks that cannot travel for extended periods of time because there are conservation issues. There, or they belong in archives where researchers need to have access to them. Uh, but through these uh, freestanding graphic panels, we were able to create, uh, to recreate that narrative, to even expand it, including other themes that include the participation of Filipinos in the farm workers movement, that include the impact of, um, of the, of the impact of the farm workers movement in environmental issues, for example, the impact of the arts in, uh, in, the, in the movement, the role they played. And that has been the show that is traveling and that is right now at Bakersfield College. And we're absolutely happy that it's there. Uh, and we're very grateful for the virtual tour that has been created, which uh, I hope you will be able to all will be able to enjoy. And so to get to, um, to some of the images of the show, Dolores, I wanted to ask you about these two photographs because uh, I've, I've 
often heard you say that um, the two people with whom you're standing in these photographs are really fun, have been fundamental in your life and in leading you to a path of um, social, of, of community organizing. Can you, can you speak about that? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, the photo of myself as a young child and uh, my mother who was there standing there with me. And of course, she was very influential because uh, she, she was very active in the community. She was a businesswoman and she kind of gave us the philosophy that uh, we had an obligation to help people. And even if they did not ask for help, if there was anything that you could do to help somebody, that you had to do it. And also not to expect the recognition or any kind of gratification, any kind of a reward. Uh, but that was something that we had to do as human beings. And also, she was also pushing me to be out in the public eye. <laughs> Because I really was a rather shy. I don't know if that picture makes me look very shy, but I, I was a very shy child. But she kept uh, making sure that uh, you know I was out there uh, doing things in public. I took dancing lessons and played the violin as a as a child. And so my mother, uh, I, I guess I don't think that she even knew what she was preparing me for. And and down the other picture, of course, is Mr. Fred Ross, and he is the one that taught the. Um, I taught me how to do the grassroots organizing, and he also taught Cesar Chavez and a lot of other organizers uh, throughout that are active throughout the United States of America. He was a, a very great, a very great teacher, and uh, and I might say very strict teacher in the way that he taught us how uh, to do house meetings, uh, to go into people's homes, to have meetings, uh, to uh, get them to remove their fears, because that is what uh, when we started organizing farm workers, there was a lot of fear because workers felt that if they got involved in anything uh, that their bosses did not like, that they wouldn't be able to work, that they would fire them, that they would be blacklisted. And uh, uh, so uh, Fred Ross was definitely uh, one of my mentors. And of course, Cesar Chavez also, I learned a lot from Cesar himself. And also, I wanna mention one other person uh, that we don't see often in these pictures, and that is Helen Chavez, uh, Cesar Chavez's wife, uh, who was a very, very strong woman. And uh, you know, we learned a lot from Helen also. Dolores, can you talk a little bit about your your childhood, your upbringing, um, how um, how your mother raised you, if she had a parenting philosophy, um, how you had two siblings, um, both of them uh, boys, and so I wonder what was the sort of the gender dynamic at, in your house and um, how was it to grow up in, in Stockton with your mother who, who was divorced, right? Yes, uh, well, I guess as a single parent, uh, my mother, uh, you know, she was gone a lot because she actually worked two jobs. She would work by day uh, as, a, as a waitress in a restaurant and by night in a cannery. And she was working two jobs because she wanted to save enough money uh, to start her own business, which she eventually did. And so at home, uh, we were pretty much uh, often, uh, had somebody taking care of us, my grandfather or an aunt or somebody, but we had to do all the housework. And so we had to wash the dishes and sweep the floors, make up, make sure we had made up our own beds, etc. But my mother, my two brothers had to do the equal amount of work that I did. And my mother would have a chart up there with our names on it. And we had to go out there and if it was your turn to wash the dishes this week. Then you had to put your little check in there that you washed the dishes. But she was definitely an equal opportunity mother uh, to make sure that the boys in the family did the same kind of work that I had to do. In fact, my brothers always say that I was spoiled, that they, uh, they, that they did more work than they did. And so both, both of my brothers, you know, they, we all washed our own clothes. We ironed our own clothes. I was never asked by my mother to do anything for my brothers. They had to do whatever they needed. They had to take care of themselves. And you think that had an impact later on in your life as you were raising your children too? And Absolutely. Yes. Um, and, and tell me more about Fred Ross and particularly about the community service organization. How did you come into contact with them? And also, um, can you tell us about your role there as a, as a lobbyist and how you learned these, you know, how you became trained in uh, a skill that uh, 
that was new and at which you were excellent. Well, thank you. Well, uh, yes, uh, well, Mr. Ross taught, taught us how to do house meetings, and we still do that method of organizing uh, with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Uh, we, but of course, right now we can't because we're kind of locked down, so our meetings have to be virtual. But basically, the way you do house meetings is you just meet in people's living rooms. You talk about the issues. Uh, you show people uh, ways that, th that they can solve the issues, or that they have to make a commitment. And then we have to get them to commit that they will also join. And the main thing that we say to people is uh, all of these problems that we have right now that you are living, uh, they're not going to be solved unless you do it. You can't wait for somebody to come and do it for you. But the way that we can you know, meet these challenges is to uh, come together as a group because one person can't do it by themselves. We've got to come together and we've got to take direct action. And this is that we are able to... And then Fred Ross would show us pictures of what they did in Los Angeles, bringing in uh, street lights and sidewalks and clinics into East Los Angeles, uh, the Mexican-American areas and by registering people to vote and the politicians finally paid attention to them. And the one thing I, I just wanna share with uh, the students that, that are here today, the one thing that I did learn in all of the work that I've done is that there, there's always somebody out there that will help you. Uh, when Cesar asked me uh, uh, to be the lobbyist, uh, well, yeah, for the, uh, for the uh, community service organization. So I went to Sacramento, I met with, I met with uh, and some of the legislators, some of the people in Sacramento, and I asked them, how do you pass a bill? Uh, how do you make something into a law? And they explained it to me. So everything that I did, I just asked somebody out there that was doing the work uh, to, to tell me how they did it. And that's how I learned. So you kind of learn by doing. And, and, and the same thing with negotiating contracts. When I was put in charge of negotiating the contracts, uh, then I, when I, I talked to some of the labor leaders that I knew and I asked, and I asked them, how do you negotiate contracts? And they explained it to me. And then I, uh, they gave me copies of different contracts. I collected them. And then I wrote up our own contract for the farm workers. So yeah, I think this is a, the greatest thing I think about uh, the, both the community service organization. And by the way, we had a chapter here of CSO in Bakersfield for many, many years. And the United Farm Workers is, uh, we created a lot, we create a lot of, created a lot of leadership. Uh, and people learn by doing, uh, as, as they do in the, in the our foundation today. They learn by doing the work. That's wonderful. Um, I, I really love this picture because of the, of the messages around the two of you, and particularly that now is the time in front of, of you two in that podium. It makes me, it makes it, the photograph very poignant. Okay, and, and so you joined the community service organization. You were a lobbyist with them for several years. You achieved some very important uh, initiatives there um, that perhaps you can tell us about, you know, such as the bilingual driver's tests, right? Yes, yeah, so how we were able to get the, not only did we were able to get the driver's license in Spanish, but in CSO, we also got uh, the voting ballots in Spanish. And I think, uh, and maybe except for New Mexico, which in that state of New Mexico, everything has to be bilingual by law as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that was signed when they took all of those lands from Mexico and including California. But uh, we were able to pass a law that, that all of our uh, voting ballots could be, had to be in Spanish uh, the, 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 and also that all of the people get, could get their driver's license in Spanish. That was very important to people because many people couldn't pass their driver's test because they didn't understand the English. But at some point yet, um, you and Cesar Chavez decided to branch out from the community service organization, right? And to dedicate yourselves to organizing farm workers. Yes, because we thought that the CSOs, it was called, would support us uh, to organize farm workers. But when we had the convention where, the, where they were going to vote uh, to do, uh, they were gonna try to do a pilot project under the CSO but the delegates voted against it. And one of the reasons that they voted against it is because uh, many of the leaders in the community service organization were labor leaders. And they felt that uh, if we tried to organize farm workers, it would be what they call dual unionism. And so they voted it down. And so uh, Cesar and I both left the CSO and we started the United Farm Workers. 
here we have some images that depict the, the terrible working conditions that the farm workers struggled with in the early 1960s. Um, can you tell us about what, what were the issues that you were organizing for? Well, we can see right there that this gentleman is out there in the field uh, and there is no porta potty out there for him. There's no toilet out there for him. And this was devastating, especially to the women uh, because the women, they would have to make a circle uh, if somebody had to go to the bathroom, they would have to use towels or sheets and, and uh, there's, you know, they wouldn't provide them with drinking water or relief periods. And so they were treated like animals, not like human beings. I think that was one of the grievances that they had. They had to work long hours for very low pay. And then you have this other a picture here about uh, how they're spraying. They would spray the workers with pesticides. And, it, and by the way, some of that still happens today. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a lot of farm workers right here in Bakersfield that were sprayed with a combination, a cocktail of different pesticides. So that is one of the things that still needs to be corrected. Uh, we were able to pass laws in California that they have to let the, they have to, you know, they have to register when they're going to use some of these restricted pesticides uh, so that people can have access to the information that they have to post the fields. Uh, but there's a lot of violations and uh, there are more laws that have been presented to, again uh, to make it safer for farm workers. But eventually uh, we have to take the whole issue of economic poisons, which is what the pesticides are, take it out of agriculture, take it out of the EPA and put it under the Health and Human Services uh, a Department of our government because these are economic poisons that are being put on our food. And we have the highest cancer rate in the United States of any, uh, uh, of any other country. And, and that is of course due to all of the poisons that are put on our food. So it's really, um, it's, a, it's a terrible issue affecting farm workers, but it, it also affects uh, a broader population. And yeah, the consumers, right? The consumers that eat the food that have the poisons on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these were the issues for which you were organizing. And together with Cesar Chavez, you founded the National Farm Workers Association in 1962. Mm -hmm. Here we see you signing up members at the inaugural convention. And, uh, and the reason that we uh, called our, ourselves an association is because we didn't want the growers to know what we were doing because we knew that they would try to squash us right away. So we called ourselves National Farm Workers Association and that way they, they wouldn't know that we were forming a union. That's really interesting. And so it was uh, in order to not scare or not raise any flags among the among the growers, mm -hmm. but uh, was, was there also some um, some trepidation, perhaps some some uh, hesitation from the farm workers themselves uh, in fear of retaliation, joining a union? Oh yes, the, the fear was was intense uh, because uh, they knew that they they could, they would get fired if they knew that they were uh, you know trying to organize a union. And of course, we knew later that there was also a lot of violence and brutality associated with that. So, so we tried to keep it uh, undercover pretty much uh, when we started our, and, and we organized for three years. We started organizing in 1962 and the grape strike didn't uh, start until 1965. So the picture that you're seeing here uh, is actually uh, our inaugural convention and uh, and we had delegates from different parts of the San Joaquin Valley. We had people from, uh, from Stockton, California, from Fresno, uh, from uh, Tulare. Uh, we had people from the, from the coast also, from Watsonville and other areas. So they represented a large group of uh, farm worker committees that we had, or we had organized. That's amazing to think about the different, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the different branches, the different, um, well, about the network that mm -hmm. you create. Mm -hmm before social media, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you have to do it, when you have to do it by foot. Um, this is a photograph of the peregrinación of the march from uh, Delano to Sacramento in 1966. Can you tell us about that moment? Well, you know, we had been on strike uh, for several months. And at the beginning, you know, people were bringing us food, they were bringing us clothes, uh, they were donating money to keep the strike going. 
and uh, it, and kind of people started, uh, you know, kind of forgetting about us because this this march started uh, in March, I believe. Uh, in fact, I think it was on St. Patrick's Day, just during this period of time and during Lent. And uh, so we thought, what should we do? So uh, we came up with the idea of having the march. And, and you know, Cesar Chavez and myself I had read a lot about Gandhi. In fact, when I met Cesar, I was surprised that he had studied so much about Mahatma Gandhi as I had also when I was in college. And so uh, we thought, well, let's do a march. This is what Gandhi used to do, do these big marches. So we started, uh, they started this march from Delano to Sacramento. And, and the, the thing about this march is uh, that uh, they didn't go down the main thoroughfares. They went through all of the back roads. They went through all of the farm worker towns because at the same time, uh, basically the message was to let farm workers know and let the public know that we were organizing. And, uh, and so we, we did our march to the state capital, uh, to Sacramento, California. And we arrived there on Easter Sunday. So it was like during this period of time that we're living right now, that this march took place. And the other great thing I want to mention about this march is when they left Delano, California, I think there were like 70 strikers that did the march. When they got to Sacramento, there were 10,000 people. So I like to say that to folks that sometimes they think, oh, we're just a, we're a small number. We really can't make this happen. And I like to let, share this with people that when we started the union, there were only three of us. It was Cesar Chavez, his wife, Helen, and myself just the three of us. So, and, you know, so we, we should never hesitate to say, uh, I can't do it because whatever my, whatever it is that I want to do for social justice, because I'm just one person. No, just find somebody else to help you. <laughs> and so um, there are many, um, many dimensions to talk about the mm -hmm. movement, right? One of them, that I would love to um, to hear you elaborate on is the collaboration between uh, Mexicans and Mexican Americans and Filipino mm -hmm. farm workers, um, and and then after that, um, I would love to hear you speak also about how uh, how the movement to come nationally really and 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 the what it meant to have the support of of senator bobby kennedy for example yeah that that was so important well as you said before that uh, United Farm Workers Organizing Committee which i had uh, initially been part of that organization but i left and, and the reason that i left is because they started uh, working with labor contractors and deducting money from people's paychecks, even though they hadn't really gotten any benefits yet. And so that's when I left uh, uh, the UFWOC and that's when Cesar and I decided it's time to start our own union, right? And so, uh, and of course, Larry Edong stayed behind and became the head of that, of that pretty much the leader of that organization. But uh, this picture here, uh, it shows uh, that we've already combined because it, then it became United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, as you said before. So the Filipino brothers and the, and the Mexican workers were all working together at that point in time. And of course, this is one great picture when Senator Kennedy came uh, to Delano, California. And he, you know, we didn't know that we didn't know this at the time, but Senator Kennedy had already decided that he was going to run for the presidency, but he had not made it public. But at the end of this rally, and there were thousands of farm workers at, uh, at the park there in Delano, California, and uh, they were all shouting, Kennedy for president, Kennedy for president. It was a, a very stirring moment. And of course, the, the reason that we were there at the park is because Cesar was ending his 25 day water only fast. And, uh, I, and I, by the way, I had been working in New York City on the boycott. And so I flew out uh, back to California uh, just a few days uh, uh, before, before uh, this, uh, this uh, Caesar ended his fast. And uh, I am the one that had been entrusted to make, sh make sure you get Bobby Kennedy to, to come uh, when Caesar ends his fast. And that, that was my job in New York. And, and Sen Senator Kennedy had been supporting us. He had helped, uh, had done fundraisers for, uh, for the farm workers, you know, so he had been, had been a great supporter before he came. So a lot is happening, right? We have the strike, which starts in 1965 and lasts five years. It's, and, and, and when you started, you don't know how long it's gonna last. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, a little after the strike, the boycott starts as well. Mm -hmm. And the boycott involves every uh, consumers around the nation, right? Mm -hmm. And beyond that, beyond the nation too, it, mm -hmm. it, it became an international thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, can, can you tell me about that moment? Uh, well, uh, this, well, this was right in the middle of the boycott. Uh, when this picture was taken. And by the way, the other gentleman there, and Imutan, uh, was also one of the Filipino vice presidents uh, of the uh, United Farm of our United Farmworkers Organizing Committee. And 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 uh, when you know when we finally had the charter uh, from the AFL CIO and just became United Farm Workers, uh, both Larry and 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 uh, uh, Larry Ilong and and Imutan were part of the list of the vice presidents. So of course. We couldn't win the strike because uh, there were so many, they were bringing in strike breakers. We're so close to Mexico that they could just bring in strike, uh, people to break the strike almost overnight. And so, it, so it wasn't until, actually we had an attorney that was one of our volunteer attorneys. And he's still alive today. His name is Stu Weinberg. He's an attorney in San Francisco. And he had uh, been uh, visiting us and volunteering. And we were all meeting together. There was a small group of us and we were saying, what are we going to do? We're not going to be able to win the strike. Uh, there's an endless supply of, of strike breakers that they can bring in. And then he said to us, have you ever thought of starting a boycott? And we said, well, okay, explain that. And this is when they were having the, they had just had the uh, the, Montgomery, the bus boycott in Montgomery when all of the uh, black folk just, uh, decided not to ride the buses because they were making them, you know, stay at the back of the bus. And so they just decided not to ride the buses. And I think that boycott went on for over a year, but they finally won. And so we thought, okay, we'll try that. We'll do a boycott. And then some of our young volunteers, uh, they started the first boycott that we had was a, against one of our companies uh, that was on strike called Shenley, uh, which was a, it was a liquor company, but they had a vineyard there in Delano. And so our young volunteers, and actually some of them hitchhiked <laughs> all the way to, to go back east to St. Louis, and they went to New York City, and they started this boycott against Shenley, and, and it was successful. Uh, so then, uh, you know, we, so we, we boycotted several of the wine companies, and we got a few wine contracts, but then we had the, the whole grape industry, and uh, that, that we, in the, so there were more strikes, and uh, so we said, we, no, we have to strike the grape industry, and so we started the uh, started the great boycott. And I was in New York City, uh, you know, heading up that boycott uh, when Bobby Kennedy came to Delano. But it was successful because we were able to get 17 million Americans uh, not, not to eat grapes or not to buy grapes. And that is what brought the growers to the table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, it was very much in the news. One of the fascinating things about uh, doing research on this period was just reading all the press on the boycott and realizing what sort of economic pressure mm -hmm. um, consumers and farm workers were putting around the nation and, um, and how effective it was as a, as a political tool, right? right. Um, really fascinating. Um, another fascinating thing is the reach of that boycott. Uh, we found, um, I found, for example, little pins supporting the boycott and photographs from uh, uh, Quebec, mm -hmm. in Canada, or found um, uh, pins supporting the boycott in Arabic. And so you realize that this was a movement that counted with incredible international and multicultural support. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Rosales just put in the chat that this was probably the most significant uh, boycott that had been held in the United States of America. Because, but it, I guess the significant thing about the boycott is that the farm workers themselves are the ones that went out to the cities. And if, if we have a moment, if I could just tell a story of one of our boycotters. Now, he's still alive today. He lives in Chicago. But he was completely illiterate, could not read uh, he could not read or write English. Uh, he could speak Spanish, couldn't read or write in Spanish either. And when Caesar was asking for volunteers to go, and the farm workers to volunteer to go on the boycott, and he put the names of the cities on, you know, 
I had this a big uh, butcher paper. Uh, I guess we call it, we don't call it butcher paper anymore. We call it the notepad yeah, on the wall. And he put down Boston. Who wants to go to Boston? And the Marco Sadi had said Barstow. And he had a girlfriend in Barstow. <laughs> so he held up his hand that he was going to go to Barstow. Little did he know they put him on a plane and he ended up in Boston. <laughs> And so here he is in Cambridge, you know, we have Yale University, and you have Harvard and Boston University and all of these great universities. And this man who could not read or write was sent there for the boycott. The wonderful lesson about Marcos Munoz is that he was the first one to clean the city of Boston of grapes and to the whole state of Massachusetts of grapes. And how did he do it? He would get the students from Yale and Harvard to do his leaflets, uh, to do his picket lines, uh, because he couldn't read or write, so he, they had to do all the work for him. And in fact, uh, people know Hugo Morales, who was uh, the head of the uh, Radio Bilingue. Uh, he was one of the people that Marcos organized to come to his picket lines. What an amazing story, wow. And so that boycott brought growers to the table, and mm -hmm. he here you are negotiating contracts. You became the main contract negotiator for the union. Mm -hmm. um, I think I remember reading that by 1972, you had you had negotiating something negotiated something like a hundred contracts, and you were very often the only woman at the table and in the room. Um, and uh, the, the union loved you because you were relentless and you persisted in your demands and you're an incredible negotiator. Mm -hmm. But the growers called you uh, the dragon lady. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about that? What was it like to be, um, to be that person representing the union and negotiating the contracts? Well, I think the reason they call me that is because I think sometimes the, like, we were able to get such good contracts for the workers with a pension plan and a medical plan and a check off of the credit union, you know, get personal time off of them because many, many of them were lived in Mexico and would come up to work, uh, uh, you know, in the different places that they went. Uh, but literally, I was, I always say I was like the interpreter for the workers, like I'm looking at this table right here in the picture. And uh, the, these, these men were so smart so intelligent and uh, this was a, a lettuce crew here and uh, they had to divide uh, what they earned between the loaders and the swampers and the cutters and the packers and the staplers of the lettuce boxes because this, this is the ground lettuce that they cut and they were so so they were such a genius in their mathematics and i literally pretty much just translated for them you know we would meet uh, separately and then we would come to the table and give our proposals to the growers uh, but it, it was a, it was a great and I, I always just admire uh, the intelligence of all of the farm workers uh, many of them never have any kind of formal education uh, but that doesn't mean that, that they don't know what they're doing they are very very intelligent I think uh, with the gentleman who was next to at the, at the front table here I think he went on uh, his name was Jose Morales. He went on in, into uh, Baja California afterwards, and I think he became a public official there. And I and I also read, and I think we have talked about how you sometimes would bring into these negotiating meetings your children, and you would, you know, every now and then when it when it was necessary, take a break to feed them or to just mm -hmm. give them some attention, and that also brought another dimension into the meeting, very human, right? Well, yes, I would have to take a nursing break. <laughs> and that was for Camila, for my daughter Camila. That's amazing. And um, I can imagine just how uh, how that could throw some some people off, you know, like, uh, what do you mean? we That didn't used to happen when it was only men here, right? But suddenly you have a woman at the table and you have to make sure that the family is provided for, right? And there's, there's a great uh, a joke that uh, one of my assistants uh, who would go with me to negotiations said that when I, I reached into uh, my case to pull out a proposal that I was gonna put on the table, I reached out a pamper instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, okay, so, um, 
This is another photograph that I like very much because um, if you've seen the, the images I've shown until now, um, very often you are, you, you're, we see you there among many, uh, among a mainly male population, uh, either the growers or the farm workers themselves. Mm -hmm. But something that you brought to the table and you've said also that Helen Chavez also brought to the table was your presence as women in the movement. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that was important to mobilize mm -hmm. women who were also farm workers and mothers and, uh, but who saw themselves more having a rather domestic role. Um, but you proposed another model to them. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, actually, about half of the workforce in the grapes is are women. About half of the workforce in the grapes are women. Uh, in the lettuce industry, uh, they used to have the women on the machines. And uh, uh, so it, and women were always in the forefront, as they are in many, many struggles. Women are always in the forefront of the struggle. Uh, sometimes where the women get lost, as they did actually in our union also, when it came down to the uh, taking the positions on the executive board, et cetera, and that's the, where the women got lost. In the United Farm Workers, women uh, ran a lot of, they ran the clinics, they, they ran different field offices, and they were very, very present in terms of leadership, uh, but just, just short. Uh, of the executive board. And uh, it's funny because when uh, I remember once somebody asking Caesar, why do you have so many women uh, in leadership here? And he said, because they do the work. <laughs> he had a very short answer for it, for that. But in the prior picture that we showed about the, uh, the negotiating committee from Sun Harvest and the leaders uh, of that organization, uh, the women uh, that were working on the machines that they weren't getting as good a wages as the lettuce cutters were. And so the lettuce cutters went out on strike so that the women uh, could uh, get more wages uh, for, for their contract. And they did it on Labor Day, which is really amazing. And, and you know what? They ran the whole strike themselves. We didn't have to send any of our union staff to, and even myself, I remember, I think they had the, the Olympics or something that was going on at the same time. And they just ran the whole strike themselves, but we just had such, such incredible leadership. That's, that's really wonderful and fascinating um, that to hear that um, it's really a misconception that, that women uh, were not so present in the, um, in, the, in the leadership positions, they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Another dimension that I would like to talk about is um, the role of art in the farm workers movement. And this is really, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, portraits at the portrait gallery. Uh, and I had the, the great uh, pleasure of acquiring it for the, for the museum. And, and this particular one is dedicated by Dolores to Barbara Carrasco who made the silk screen honoring Dolores. Um, she wanted to create an iconic image of her. Mm. But also I really encourage you to look at the virtual tour for the exhibition because this is an area that we really expanded in the, in the show. And there are photographs of the Teatro Campesino directed by Luis Valdez. There are photographs, uh, there are other artworks reproduced, notably by Esther Hernandez, very iconic works and by Javier Viramontes. Um, and, you know, there were so many artists who, uh, who made artwork in support of the farm workers. Can you, can you talk about that relationship between the arts and the movement? Yeah, the art was very important. And in fact, Barbara Carrasco, uh, when she was just a young artist, and she would bring all of these other artists from Los Angeles, and many of them became very, very famous artists. And they would paint these huge, huge, uh, murals on canvas because and they would do this for our conventions and of course our, we had our conventions like uh at the Selland arena in, in fresno or here uh in bakersfield at the big auditorium so they were there were huge huge banners uh, of murals that they painted and so the artists were very very part much part of the farmworker movement and there were many posters that came out uh during that time also 
uh, posters that that uh, were to, to motivate the, the workers and to affirm them and, and recognize them. And of course, uh, Teatro Campesino was very important to us, uh, Luis Valdez, uh, because they would do the uh, during the grape strike, which lasted for uh, the the strike lasted for five years, and you can imagine that was a long time, and people would get uh, kind of discouraged and. You know, people, but Luis Valdez with Teatro Campesino kept the spirits of the farm workers up and they would do a different kind of uh, theater skit and they would, they would be really, really funny and make everybody laugh. And so there have been a lot of spinoffs uh, from the Teatro Campesino and other groups have formed their own uh, guerrilla theater. They might, might call it the Teatro de la Gente, a theater of the people. And so, and of course, many, many songs that were written, you know, Huelga General, the strike is going to, uh, the, the songs about the children in the movement. And of course, uh, and then uh, Danny Valdez, Luis's brother, uh, was also a very big part of, uh, of, the, of the movement and uh, doing songs and theater and stuff like that. And I think it's important for that, uh, for always to think about, because a, a movement work is very difficult and very hard. So when we have art and we have music and, and theater, and that really, uh, it, it gives people the, the animo, you know, uh, so that they can keep on going and because we know that the road to social justice is a, a very long road and we don't want to get tired and we can get a little bit tired but but when we have a the, the music and the art and the theater that lifts our spirits it, it gives us the energy to keep on going right and that's something that you often mention too when people ask you what are the things you enjoy right you talk about how much you love jazz for example and how that is you know, going to a jazz concert is such a release. Oh, and Bakersfield College, by the way, where this uh, exhibition is at right now, uh, it has one of the best uh, teachers, jazz teachers, and and and, and the students. Uh, they have a wonderful, wonderful jazz program uh, there at Bakersfield College. And uh, we have a uh, once we get up over the pandemic, we have uh, a jazz workshop, and many of the students. Uh, from the Bakersfield College come and they play at that jazz workshop. I can hardly wait till we can all be together again and, and, and get our jazz, our jazz fix back because, you know, it's, it's been gone for us for a long time during the pandemic. That's wonderful. Um, Dolores, I, uh, I don't have any more images, but I want to talk about um, what has happened in the course of this exhibition, uh, being up at the Portrait Gallery and then traveling through the country. It's been six years mm. and I think um, the country has changed significantly in socially. Um, and I, I wonder what are your thoughts about that? How do, do you also see, do you, do you agree with my observation? Uh, do you, I think when we first opened this show, um, there were important struggles going on in 2015, 2016. However, um, it did seem like a celebration of something that had happened 50 years ago, this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I think um, even though there were some segments of society fighting very hard for their rights, the LD, LGBTQ segment, for example, uh, the LGBTQ community, the you know people who are um, in the struggle for um, for environmental um, you know issues. There was also, I think, some sort of um, of nostalgia that we cannot reach that kind of ferment. Mm -hmm that there was in the, in the late 60s and that, um, and that was so much part of the, of the movement that you and Cesar Chavez led. But we've had uh, quite a number of struggles after 2015 and until today. And of course, uh, we think, you know, the one that really comes most um, strongly to our minds right now is the Black Lives Matter. Uh, protests after uh, the horrific death of George Floyd last year and Breonna Taylor and, and uh, all the black people who died um, terrible, in terrible ways, uh, mm -hmm. either through um, 
through acts of violence mm -hmm. uh, from from uh, uh, white supremacists or from uh, acts of police violence. And I wonder what you have to say about that. Well, I think that we see, as you said, just stated, that we see that there are many demonstrations that are starting in the United States and then they're going international, uh, beginning with the Women's March after President Trump was elected. Um, of course, the Me Too movement, the women's movement. Uh, then we saw uh, the young people from Parkland, Florida, Emma Gonzalez, uh, when they did the marches uh, against gun violence. And of course, then, as you mentioned, we have the Black Lives Matter movement that is happening right now. It, it, you know, all of the protests, and many, I'm sure many of the students did, because we had those marches and those protests right here in Bakersfield. Uh, I have to say that I was not able to join them uh, because of COVID and because of my age. And which I, I feel very, very sad about that. But we had many, many uh, demonstrations and marches right here in our, in our, our town here in Kern County, which uh, is the most conservative county in the whole state of California. So we can see, especially with the devices that young people have now with, uh, you know, their, their cell phones and the computers and, uh, and then all of the social platforms that they can get on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, because I don't even know all of them, that you can just mobilize people so quickly. Uh, but a, a couple of things I just want to mention, though, kind of dialing back a little bit, the farm workers strike. Uh, was so effective and so strong that, and we had many students that would come, like Luis Valdez, because he was a student at San Jose State when he came uh, to Delano, and then he just stayed and didn't go back to school. By the way, he did get an honorary degree from San Jose State, but you had students from Los Angeles and from everywhere that came to volunteer with the farm workers. And what came out of that? They started having a, a student strikes in, in Los Angeles. And Sal Castro, who was one of the uh, movers and shakers of the of the student walkouts in Los Angeles, uh, he gave credit to the farm workers movement. He said if the farm farm workers could go on strike, then the students can go on strike, and it started get the whole Chicano movement. So it started in Delano, and then went all over the Southwest, even as far as places like Chicago. You know, the 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 uh, the, the Chicanos, Mexican Americans were. Uh, you know, in New Mexico and Arizona and Texas, you know, we had this great uh, movement of young uh, Latinos that got involved. And then, of course, in the boycott, we were there with the Puerto Ricans with the, with the young lords, and uh, they were also very effective in helping us. We worked with the Black Panthers uh, in Oakland and, and I just, throughout the whole United States of America. So the, this uh, farm market movement just spread everywhere. It became a, a, a really great movement. And, and I think that's what's happening today too, is that we do see, uh, again, because we can get information so quickly, we can share information, educate people on the issues and mobilize everybody that we, I think we are in a very special moment right now in our United States of America uh, with, uh, with people you know, engaging and people being involved. Uh, there's more work to do. And by the way, we are celebrating this week that uh, we have our first Filipino that has been appointed to a statewide position as attorney general. And his name is Rob Banta. And guess what? His family was involved in the strike. <laughs> and uh, they actually lived at La Paz in the headquarters of the union. And, uh, and it's somebody that we've known since he was a kid. And now he's the attorney general of the state of California. And he is the first Filipino to be appointed to a statewide position here. So we are celebrating Mabuhay. We are celebrating uh, the, the, you know, the Filipinos uh, that have contributed so much to our country and that people, many people don't know so little about what, the, what their contributions have been uh, to our United States of America. Thank you. Dolores, uh, we have many, many questions from, from the audience, but before that, I want to ask you uh, what, can you talk about uh, the situation of farm workers now as, um, um, as essential workers during the pandemic? Yeah, and uh, to your previous question, which I quite didn't answer, I think that the, the fact that we have President Biden now and that he and many others are finally recognizing the farm workers as being essential workers. And uh, that, you know, because they have been out there working to feed us every single day of the pandemic, you know, we haven't stopped eating. 
uh, we had to stop a lot of stuff, but we could, didn't stop eating. And the farmers are the ones that have been putting the food on our table every single day. And they are finally being recognized for that. Uh, in California, uh, one of the senators from San Diego, Ben Wessel, has introduced a farm worker day. So we have a Cesar Chavez holiday. Uh, we have a day of recognition for Lady Eat Long, a day of recognition for myself. But this is going to be a recognition for farm workers, you know, I'm sure it's going to pass, and I'm sure that the governor is going to sign it in the legislature. So hopefully we can all celebrate that day when farm workers are finally respected and they get the recognition. And eventually, uh, hopefully, the wages that they deserve, uh, you know, living wages. Uh, farm workers, of course, we have a minimum wage in California uh, that is higher, probably double than that of the other states. And all farm workers are covered by the minimum wage. And then, of course, you have other farm workers that are covered by contracts uh, with, that the United Farm Workers has. And those farm workers are even better off because they get higher wages above the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. and, and the pension plan and you know things that other farm workers don't have when they don't have contracts. Okay. Well, this has been an amazing interview, Dolores. And, and now we have many, many questions from the audience. So um, we can, Ronnie, do you moderate this part? Yeah, of course. Thank you. And, and and there was a good suggestion from the chat. Will you pull your screen down so we can see everyone a little better? And I had a couple questions emailed me emailed to me this week. Um, and if it, if I can start with um, Jorge Ramos, he's a grad student at Eastern Michigan University. He wanted me to ask you, Dolores, what does it mean to be a leader? A leader is someone uh, that is of service to the community and that empowers other people. So a leader is not somebody that empowers themselves, but that is always making other people strong and, you know, helping other people with their issues and their problems, but empowering them so that they can take care of their issues and their problems. So sometimes uh, it's quote unquote leaders. Uh, we're like at the front of the march. But if you don't have people behind you, <laughs> there's, no, there's no march, okay? So we always have to remember that. So how many people have we helped? How many people have we developed into leaders? That is the gauge of a leader. How much have you done for your community? Not how much have you done for yourself? Yeah. I think Cesar Chavez is a perfect model of that uh, because Cesar, when he died, his earnings were $6,000. $6,000, okay? And uh, people can still go uh, to La Paz, which is of course uh, uh, only uh, 30 miles from Bakersfield here. And the, for the people that are here from, uh, from Kern County, it's up there in Keene, California, uh, Caesar's uh, mansion. <laughs> the growers used to put out these leaves that say, Caesar Chavez has a mansion. And when you see Caesar's very modest uh, two bedroom house that is still there because La Paz, the headquarters of the union in Keene, California, which is between Bakersfield and Tehachapi on Highway 58. And you know, they will see what um, it's now a, 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 with President Obama, uh, they made it part of the National Park Service. Okay, so uh, it so they can see the, the Caesars Mansion, which is a modest uh, two bedroom home. Very humble of you. <laughs> We're amongst another leader as well. <laughs> uh, Carolyn Brandenburg, who's BC faculty in the sociology department asked, how do you find the strength or mental fortitude to continue even when faced with resistance? Well, uh, we know uh, that uh, one thing that we know for sure, if we don't do the work, it's not going to happen, okay? And we know we still have a lot of work to do out there. We're trying to challenge uh, racial discrimination, you know, uh, uh, women's reproductive rights that are in other states, not California, trying to be take it, taken away from them. Uh, we have uh, many uh, homophobic people in our society. And so we have to end all of these issues of people that are climate change deniers. And uh, our job, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, that racism is a sickness. And so we have to be the healers and we have to go out there and, uh, you know, educate people and organize them so that they will be caught in, in, in those types of uh, 
of, of uh, philosophies of hatred, hating other people because of the way that they look or because they're a different color or because of a different sex, etc. So th that is our, our, our job as here on this earth. We have to, we have to, you know, make, leave this world in a better place than when we got here. We think, and I think for young people, we think, oh, I'm going to be here a long time. No, time goes really fast. Okay. So we want to leave this place uh, when we were born here, but when we leave it, we want to leave it better than when we got here. And, and, and it's a responsibility that we all have. We showed a picture of Robert Kennedy and just minutes before he was killed, before he was assassinated, he said, you know, we have responsibilities and obligations to our fellow citizens. All of us have those responsibilities and we have to think about that. And so again, how can we help people that are in need, uh, people that need support? You know, we have to do it. And right, by the way, I just want to throw it out there right now that we have uh, three important measures right now uh, in the U.S. Senate. One of them is to protect voting rights uh, because in other states, and I know we have people from other states on this, uh, there are states where they are trying to suppress uh, people's voting rights or take them away entirely. So you know, that's, and, and that is called uh, For the People Act. And it's in the Senate, the U.S. Senate. Uh, there's another one, of course, on immigration reform. And we, we, again, we want to ask people, please write your senator. And if you have relatives in other states, call them and ask them, please email. Email your senators to, uh, to give the vote for immigration reform. And another one that is really special to me is the Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> that, that is also in the U.S. Senate. And if the Senate makes it possible uh, to, uh, to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, we can finally put it as part of the Constitution of the United States of America that men and women are equal, okay? We can make it happen in this year, but we've got to get those senators to vote for it. So if people, we, I, we have friends and relatives in other states outside of California, call them, email them, and tell them, please write your senator uh, to support S1 uh, for the People Act on voting, uh, immigration reform, and the Equal Rights Amendment. And there is a web website for the Equal Rights Amendment that I want to share. It's really easy. It's ERA. YES2021.org, E-R-A-Y-E-S2021.org. -E so that's a website for the Coalition for the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you. We'll try to get that in the chat as well. But thank, thank you, you. Such, important, mm -hmm. such important work being done. Uh, one for Taina real quick. Uh, Taina, what are your thoughts on the future of the Smithsonian Latino Museum? And how might Dolores Historia and the farm workers movement fit into the future of that uh, museum? Well, I'm, I'm absolutely happy and thrilled that finally, um, finally the museum, the measure for a museum of the American Latino has been approved. Um, we know it's a process that will take uh, some time to, to complete. Um, however, it's a very exciting, um, development and the story of Latino people in the country is absolutely essential to telling U.S. history. Uh, we have a relationship to this, um, to this country we call the United States of America that uh, extends beyond uh, well, for centuries and really even beyond the arrival of, of the pilgrims, right? Into, and so I think it's very important to remember that the building blocks of Latino identity are, uh, have been part of this um, northern part of the continent for centuries, that also the U.S. has um, relationships uh, to other uh, parts of the world through its colonial action. Um, including Puerto Rico and uh, Guam, for example. And, and so it's uh, absolutely important to incorporate those stories into the broader narrative of American history. And um, it's a very important symbol to have a museum dedicated to the story of, of US Latinos, of Latinx people, because we're fundamental to the country, because we have a longstanding presence. Uh, there are many recent arrivals, but there are also many people who never crossed the border. The, bro the border crossed them. Mm -hmm. And the story of uh, the farm workers movement, 
led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores, Dolores Huerta is fundamental to that, uh, to those contributions that ha Latinos have made to the country. Um, it was absolutely uh, revolutionary what they brought to the story of labor rights and of human rights. Mm -hmm. And um, I am very excited about seeing that as part of the broader narrative of our cultural, social and political contributions to the country. Yes, so exciting. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we, you mentioned uh, Puerto Rico uh, because uh, we, there's a lot of uh, conversation about the Mexican farm workers and, and the Filipino farm workers, but it was the Puerto Rican farm workers that actually taught us how to pick it. <laughs> There were a large number of Puerto Rican uh, that were brought in from the island uh, to work in the farms. Uh, one of the farms was the Jack Pandel Ranch. It was completely, all of the workforce were Puerto Ricans. And uh, what we, when we first started picketing, we would go out there, we'd have one person in a, in a big field, you know, it's, our fields are, are huge. And of course they were being run down by trying to, the growers would try to run them down. Uh, they would get assaulted. And the Puerto Ricans uh, said, no, that's not the way you do it, okay? You have to all come together and do a car caravan and all go together to one field or uh, never go out there by yourselves. Uh, so there was an incredible amount of leadership and talking about the Latino Museum. And uh, I, I love I love Taina's name because when I hear of her name, I, re I, you know, I remember that uh, when when the conquerors came to the islands of Puerto Rico, they killed many of the natives, right? And they were Taino Indians, is that, is that right? Yeah, they were Tainos and the Arawaks and they murdered them. They had hunting parties, you know? And uh, this is a lot of the history uh, that people don't know uh, about, about the abuses uh, that have been, you know, uh, directed at, at, at our Latino community, so in our indigenous community. So it's really, really important that uh, that, that, that history and that knowledge, uh, uh, you know, be documented and, and have places where it can be shown. So, and, you know, also the abuses of the people against the Central American people uh, that have been brought here to the United States. So uh, it's important that that Latino museum be built. And I think that some of the funding may have been in this last uh, a stimulus package, right, for the Latino Museum. I think there may have been some funding there. But now that we have uh, a, a new president, I think there will be more uh, <laughs> more support to, to build that Latino Museum. It needs to happen. Uh, there, there was a question in the chat about, about faith. And uh, that, that was a very big part uh, of the farm worker movement. Uh, in fact, when we had that March to Sacramento, and they elected uh, the captain for the march. And uh, uh, he was a very a loud spoken person, but then he, he said, I don't want to carry the Virgin of Guadalupe. And so the strikers demoted him. <laughs> they took him off as captain and they voted somebody else to carry the banner that you saw in that march picture. And so I think uh, a faith uh, played a big role uh, we used to have these huge masses where uh, Caesar would ask everybody to, uh, to take communion and he would tell the priest, you know, no, unless somebody here uh, killed somebody, you know, then, the, the, you know, just forgive their sins so that they, uh, they can, uh, so that they can uh, be able to take communion. Uh, but it was, a, and then of course Caesar, you know, with his 25 days fast that he did, you know, one, the first one in Delano, the second one in uh, Arizona. And of course the last one that he did was also in Delano, California. And, uh, so Caesar really displayed, uh, you know, his, uh, and, and he was not, uh, he, 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 he kind of criticized people that um, would just think that you, that you can solve everything just by praying. No, he said, you've got to take action, you know, so, and you had to have faith because when you're in a very hard struggle, uh, like the one that we were in, uh, you can't survive unless you have faith. Now, you know, faith, uh, it, religious faith in some respects, uh, but also uh, faith in yourself and faith in the people that you're working with. So it's a very strong component of it. Uh, we know as we go forward uh, that when we think of organized religion, we can agree uh, with the Catholic Church when it comes to working on immigration issues. We can't agree with them when it comes to gay rights or women's reproductive rights. Okay, that's where we kind of part the ways. Thank you. And I apologize to those of you with questions hanging out. I know we're not going to have time to get to all of these, 
Um, but let me ask you one more from Susanna, Susanna Hernandez. She said, as a daughter of a, of a migrant farm worker, I want to thank Dolores for her incredible work. It is an honor to hear her speak today. She said, as some populations of migrant workers become older, there has been a decline in agricultural workforce. How does the UFW, and I think probably broader organization, uh, plan to approach new generations and new migrant populations? Well, I don't think there's ever a shortage of farm workers because it's kind of an entry level job. Although I do want to say that uh, farm workers, it, it is a professional job. Uh, people should never look down or disparage farm workers uh, because that they work, the work that they do uh, is, is very important. And if uh, people that haven't done farm worker, you want to go out there for a couple of days, <laughs> you'd find that you have to be almost, uh, you have to be as fit as an athlete to be, uh, to do the farm worker. And farm workers really care about what they do. Uh, they care about the plants, you know, uh, they, they, so it's a lot of people just disparage and look down on farm workers, but they shouldn't. Uh, it, it, it is, as we said before, they're, they're feeding us every day. Can you think of anything more important than that? I used to have this joke that I would tell students and uh, my son Emilio Huerta, who's an attorney, didn't really like it, but I would say, if you had to uh, go on a deserted island somewhere and you could, could only take one person with you, who would you take, an attorney or a farm worker? I think the answer is pretty clear. You would take a farm worker. Uh, but, uh, but so I think that uh, people should never uh, feel that somehow uh, they are, you know, putting themselves down if they go out into the field to do farm work. Uh, in fact, one of the young uh, musicians there from Bakersfield College, uh, you know, he came up to me, he says, I, Senora Huerta, I want you to know that I'm still doing farm work, okay? He's going to college, but he's still doing farm work. So people should never look down on farm work as an occupation, as farm work as, as an occupation. Absolutely. Well, I just wanna thank you both. This has been such an honor. And I put a link in the chat to the Jones Gallery website. Our virtual tour is live. So I encourage you to go and check that out, walk through, enjoy the, the wonderful work and, and the display honoring Ms. Huerta's life. Um, we're gonna close, if Andrew has it ready, with a closing video. But thank you again, this has been- Can please, I just please. have a word before we close? I just Absolutely. wanna- Absolutely, uh, please I just do. Wanna, I just wanna mention that Barbara Carrasco, uh, who's made that the portrait that is available at the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Uh, and uh, if you wanna know more about our foundation, uh, we're located in Bakersville. But right now we're Everybody is not working out of the office. We're all working at home. Uh, but you can get to our website at DoloresHuerta.org. DoloresHuerta.org. And also, uh, there was a movie uh, documentary made about my work with the farm workers. And it's called Dolores, very simply. Uh, they did show it at the college once. And maybe they'll show it again. But uh, you can look it up on YouTube or on a, a PBS on Independent Lens. And uh, there, there's a lot of the footage about the strikes and, and the boycott and and many of the subjects that we've been talking about here today. Okay, so I, 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 and I also wanna say this to the students because every time I speak, I always end with this chat. And what I do is I ask you, and I know we probably can't unmute everybody, but the one thing I do want you to remember and the question that I always ask is, who's got the power? And the answer is, we've got the power. And when we say, what kind of power? We say people power, okay? And we can never, never forget that, especially now when all of us have to be engaged because we have to save our democracy of the United States of America. And we can't do that unless each and every one of us that we you know, get involved, that we go out there and we vote. And if we can't vote, get other people to vote. Okay, so don't forget that, get involved, you know, volunteer. Uh, many organizations need volunteers. And yes, we need your help. So si se puede, we can make it happen. Thank you.